All right. Awesome. And we are live with Bennett Hoffman. Hey, Bennett, how are you doing? Hey, pretty good, Sonny. How are you? I am well. I am well. I, uh, it's, it's been a while. Uh, yeah. It's been a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I like to kind of start with how I met or maybe when we met. Um, do you remember the year that we had first crossed, crossed paths? I think it was, it was probably either 2013 or 2014. 2013 or 2014. Right, right, right. And so it's been, wow, almost seven years since then. And uh, yeah, yeah, I guess you could say it's been a bit of a journey. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, more, uh, for sure. But, 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 you know, I, I know I've maybe heard like bits and pieces of your story, but really the main, the main kind of the, the theme of, of this, uh, whatever the hell I'm doing here is really been around, um, you know, capturing people that at least I've, I've been, uh, intrigued by, uh, inspired by, and, um, and just along the, the, the way, you know, kind of like how Bitcoin has touched people's lives and what their thoughts on it. So that, that was kind of the, you know, the, the goal, but would love to, you know, kind of give you some time to share your story, like your, your backstory before you learned about Bitcoin first and then segueing into after. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, my, I'll give kind of my normal backstory if, if I'm trying to lay it out for somebody, but uh, in, ter in terms of kind of the technical world, I, uh, you know, grew up, uh, and I wanted to make, when I was young, I wanted to make video games, which is kind of how I got into tech. And I was lucky that uh, in eighth grade at my middle school, they had a pilot program where they were teaching C++. And so like I started kind of getting into the software development side of stuff pretty young. Um, uh, ended up dropping out to go to Microsoft, um, which is where I met. Someone you're you're familiar with, and who? All right, we're back. Yeah, sorry, Ben, a little bit of a technical difficulty, but we'll uh, we'll get. I think we got to figure it figured out. Um, okay, so I guess yeah, uh, maybe you should get rewind a little bit because I think I lost a bit in translation there. But sure. what what? Uh, so so you said I heard you say um, you know more from a technical back, uh, perspective. You uh, anyway, so I, I lost you. You said Microsoft. There were a couple of yeah uh, things in there, but if you can repeat it, it'd be great. So yeah, I'll just I'll run through the whole, yeah, whole yeah, thing please. again, which is when I, I I started off getting into software and like programming young because I wanted to make video games. I thought, right. uh, and I was lucky that I had some opportunities, you know, in my elementary or, or uh, secondary schooling to kind of get a head start there. Um, and I ended up dropping out of college to go to Microsoft. Uh, where, which is where I met Cedric, who's someone, you know, who you work, you know, we all work together at Buttercoin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's actually where, you know, I, I found out about Bitcoin really early uh, in its development. So uh, I, I think it was probably early 2010 that I first heard about it. I didn't buy any. <laughs> like, I, was a, I was an idiot. Uh, <laughs> but I, um, the reason I was initially interested in it is because I've got, you know, a bit of a nerdier side. There's like a bunch of interest in like sci-fi um, and that kind of stuff. And so when I heard about it, it just sounded like the kind of money you know, like credits or, or it's not like something that I would hear about in a sci-fi novel, right? And um, and so at first I was like, nah, this seems like bullshit. And I went and I tried to break it, you know, I messed with it a little bit and, and, and tried to find the obvious flaw. And I couldn't, obviously, because uh, <laughs> it works. But, I, you know, and that when I couldn't figure out what was obviously wrong with it, then I was like, oh, this is actually interesting and so i started paying attention to it um and I, I did buy some i had some earlier on uh that i unfortunately ended up selling uh when we were starting uh doing buttercoin um so you know i could i could have been a, a much more og holder but uh <laughs> mm -hmm. ended up doing okay um so you know that's that's kind of after microsoft i started uh 
small company was that are doing analytics. We made a parkour documentary, kind of wandered around a bit until we ended up in uh, in Silicon Valley and uh, tried actually to apply to Y Combinator with a different idea about uh, a pod, this podcasting site. It doesn't, not really, not really important, but that got rejected for uh, pretty reasonable reasons. Uh, and then we, the next session, we um, ended up going through Y Combinator with, uh, uh, yeah, for Buttercoin, which is a, a Bitcoin exchange. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, it was a Bitcoin exchange that we started in 2013. Um, I think we have the somewhat dubious distinction of being the only uh, Bitcoin exchange to go out of business without losing any customer funds. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we never got hacked or anything. We just, um, you know, we, we were able to go live and, and, and start operating and then uh, basically needed to raise more money to uh, get regulatory licenses and, and that kind of stuff and weren't able to do so uh, fast enough, basically. Um, and had to shut down because we didn't want to go to jail. Uh, <laughs> but it was basically, we, we launched around the same time, slightly earlier than like Coinbase uh pro exchange did and um you know ended up being i guess out competed by them was was the uh so that, that's kind of the early you know up through the the kind of where we met and, and worked together on some stuff in bitcoin uh story ah uh, dad yeah <laughs> there's a lot um so uh... Yeah, no, I, I actually remember flying into San Francisco and meeting you guys for the first time. It was yeah. uh, pretty pretty exciting because we'd all connected over the internet and yeah, probably yeah. just over the fact that, you know, we all thought Bitcoin was going somewhere. Um, uh, I guess my first question would be like around Bitcoin, right? So what was it? So I, I, heard, I think it was like Bloomberg or something where you and Cedric were on. I remember you talking about like Star Wars and like kind of like <laughs> how, it, how it reminded you of like futuristic money. And there's one thing I'll never forget that I'm pretty sure I heard you say, but I paired it to this day, uh, which is around like, I, it was, it was it you that talked about like autonomous cars using Bitcoin someday as like a way of... Uh, you know, commerce yeah. thing between one another. Yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, I, I liked to use the like the idea. You know, it's kind of like a straw man. It's not necessarily how it's going to work, but the idea that you could have autonomous self-driving cars, which you know we're seeing being developed, uh, running around uh, picking people up, but but that you know they're not going to be always. Uh, active so there's gonna be changes in demand just like there is now so uh, a self-driving car would have to go be it has to be somewhere so it has to go park but that they got to pay for parking and how does a self-driving car pay for parking well it probably you know is able to use some kind of cryptocurrency micropayment system to lease out you know by the minute or by the second some spot uh and you can have you, you extend that a lot of different ways where maybe there's you know if you want to get somewhere fast you can you can pay other smart cars to move out of the way and let you have like a you know yeah I <laughs> there's that. all kinds of stuff you do um yeah and uh the the idea there the, the part of it that's interesting interesting because you could do that in theory there's like lots of ways you could do the same thing but um the idea that with bitcoin it could be permissionless in terms of it being a protocol as opposed to Uber, right? Or Tesla being in control of how all this works. So, you know, if you wanted to have something like this now, you, if you were a parking spot or a parking lot operator, you'd have to partner with Tesla so that their cars could talk to your system and have the payments worked out, right? And probably be all settled in batch, you know, things over ACH or whatever. Um, whereas, with Bitcoin and what you know, this is before Lightning and before even when we started with Buttercoin, it was before Multisig was even uh, really available, you know, in terms of P2SH or anything like that. Um, so it was kind of a very pie in the sky thing. But you know, that's what you're seeing with with like 
the, the idea of payment channels and, and kind of these other things uh, allowing doing doing layer you know off chain transactions, much more high throughput, smaller value transactions. That I think you are going to enable those kinds of uh, technologies, basically enabling autonomous agents to to uh, participate in an economic system, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and so I mean, even but even okay. So a couple of things on that point. So why Combinator? Right, that's obviously epic. Um, I think Google Ventures, right, had invested as well. Yeah. Uh, there were like people like Alexi Ohanian from Reddit, and so um, and, and you know, and you also kind of went on to say that you know it was probably one of the few exchanges that that failed without you know taking people's money and whatnot, right? I think that's kind of a that that that's something to be proud of because. Um, you know what I mean? Like there, I, it's so in this space, especially it's so hard to have a, like a moral compass sometimes and to do kind of the right thing all the time. And, um, and, you know, and we saw a lot of things play out right in this industry with like ICOs yeah. and people kind of just like being very, what's the word, like almost like, um, just, yeah, not really caring, right, about what the consequences might be and, and really just kind of like just doing whatever they can just because it's technologically possible. Right. It's, it's, so I just, just curious. I mean, there's a lot in there. But yeah, sorry, well, go ahead. The, it's the mm -hmm. whole move fast and break things mentality of a lot of software, as well as there being just people who are straight up scammers in the space for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, like we, we the problem at Buttercoin wasn't like what we built or, or our security or anything like that. It was really just running into the regulatory issues in the US. And like, that's something that, um, you know, we knew about and, and like we had a plan for it that ended up not working. But when we were talking to people raising money, like you mentioned that we did Y Combinator and we were backed by Google Ventures and a couple other kind of, you know, quality VCs and stuff. Uh, but we actually had, we never did a, a series A, like we had actually a couple opportunities. Uh, one of them fell apart because we had a third founder initially and that didn't work out. Um, and so the deal fell apart there, but we also had an offer from, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I think I'm allowed to talk about this, but basically we, uh, without getting into specifics of what we were talking about, we were, we were talking to Chamath at Social Capital um, and he, his like, for one of his conditions for even like considering any kind of investment in us would be that we would leave the US, <laughs> right? And go like build it in Singapore or something, which like in retrospect is what, you know, was a good idea, right? Um, and, you know, I don't know if it is something we would have been willing or able to do, but, you know, I think that the, uh, the, you're right that we, we did do, we were trying to do everything right because part of the mission of what we were doing was um trying to be like a kind of a virus which is like not a good way of putting it it's not flattering but we wanted to be a uh a carrier for the the, the bitcoin meme into regulated financial space to help with institutional adoption right so we like we could have started a, an exchange in singapore or somewhere else outside of the us and probably done well and made you know, money and, and all that. Uh, but the, the kind of mission of the company was to further um, adoption inside of institutional circles. And it was interesting because it, it had a bit of a, <clears throat> I don't know what you want to call it, like a cult-like following, right? Like, I mean, it, it felt like it it resonated really like deeply with with a lot of people in a way that I haven't seen really before or after, right? Where, where I mean, at least, like, I mean, there's a regulatory piece obviously and and all of that um, and investment, but but in from like a UX, just overall experience, yeah. security, like the right type of investors, it just, it, it seemed like a perfect storm. Yeah, everyone, <laughs> everyone, like everyone, like everyone that used it liked it, that we were, you were, we were break even. Uh, in terms of like, so we were like a successful company outside of the, the regulatory issue. <laughs> 
so so i have a, i have a question so do you it, it, i mean i guess in 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 hindsight it's like it's so easy to just be like oh well this is the, we should have been doing this differently it's it's almost impossible to to say in the moment but but in hindsight you know do, are there if you could like rewind back in time knowing now how you know how the industry's played out are there like one or two things that you kind of be, you kind of, I mean, I, I try not to think about things in the past, to be honest. So it's kind of an unfair question, but sure. I'm curious, have you thought much about like what might have been, yeah. you know, a pivot or two that could have really. Yeah. So we, know, had, we had a couple of, we talked about a couple of pivots that like would have, I think been in hindsight, very good. One would be uh, issuing um, US dollars as like a, the business is not doing fiat currency and only doing crypto crypto trading which was kind of because this was before like poloniex for example um so obviously that there was that was a market and uh while it would not have actually solved the problem that we ended up running into from a regulatory perspective but it, it would have uh i think definitely given us more time because it was an open question whether or not uh if you were never touching Fiat, were you still subject to the same regulatory framework? And like now, we know that the answer is yes. Like the reason that you don't have, uh, you know, centralized, unregulated, uh, like AML lists or KYC lists, uh, crypto only exchanges in the U.S. Um, so that was one of them. I think that would have could have been good. But the, the other one that I think was it was definitely it was probably too early because um, we were basically trying to figure out a way to do it without smart contracts because again this is before ethereum was around the ethereum pre-sale i think was in like 2014 i want to say um so we were we were kind of early in there but we we were kicking around this idea of what we called <laughs> the butterboard because it was all of our naming was awful uh <laughs> but the, the idea of if effectively what would be now called a dex um so a way for people to uh trade you know things in a in a you know in a way where it was totally non-custodial right because mm -hmm. that's the, the big thing if it's if it's not we we were very confident that if we were able to be non-custodial then we wouldn't we did didn't have any uh um anti-money laundering or kyc liability mm -hmm. requirement. Mm -hmm. um so yeah we we did look at that but Ultimately, at the end of the day, I, I'm not confident it would have worked, uh, just because like the uh, like I said, it's pre Ethereum, so like the the like we eventually got there. Like Uniswap is like a perfect example of something like that, right? Mm. But uh, when when you're still early and like basically you had Bitcoin and a bunch of the first wave of altcoins, most of which aren't around anymore, right? Um, it would have been uh, less technically viable to do in a way that actually was decentralized. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, Uniswap. Any any thoughts on that, by the way, just in general? I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess um, this is, uh, you kind of ran through some of the questions you wanted to ask before, and it's kind of, I don't know if it goes to a, uh, a thing that nobody else believes in Bitcoin, but it's mm. it's in my my perspective has shifted a lot on a couple of things, and and one of them is around uh, DeFi and 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 that whole world. Uh, so my I, I'm not a I guess this is maybe something I a perspective I hold which is different from a lot of people because I I, I was and am to a large extent still a Bitcoin maximalist in in what I call it, like a soft maximalist respect. I don't think there's any, I don't have any particular, uh, it's not like a moral position for me. I don't think Bitcoin should be the maximal solution, right? I just had like, when I looked at how things were progressing and I saw, you know, the, the incentive structures of things and, and um, the development of things like Taproot and, uh, and like the, uh, just, just layer two technologies being built on top of Bitcoin and the potentials for for those. Um, I just didn't really see any reason that it wouldn't. Uh, if, if there were like 
a huge demand for privacy coins all of a sudden adding on like a privacy you know a, a confidential transaction side chain or drive chain to bitcoin could solve that and you retain then the full liquidity of bitcoin right so it's like basically from a, i didn't see any real compelling technical reason that anything else would step in um and ultimately the the liquidity and censorship resistance were the things that were most important to me in terms of the core value. And I still think that that's true for Bitcoin. Like, I think that censorship resistance it, and liquidity are like both very, very core to the value proposition there. Uh, and I still think that in that regard, you know, I still think Bitcoin wins unless something radically changes. But um, the DeFi kind of explosion this last year has uh, give me another perspective in that it's like why is censorship resistance important and it's it's basically uh because it gives you what i call the option of exit so the real ultimate value of bitcoin for me like why i think it's valuable is, is that you can take money or, or wealth somewhere you can move it into bitcoin you can memorize 24 words you can walk onto a plane walk off a plane somewhere else and get all you know modular volatility and any slippage, you can get your wealth back, right? And so it lets you move between regulatory government economic regimes freely, right? So that's like, so that that level, the level of censorship resistance required there is extremely high because you have to be able to deal with state actors trying to stop you, right? Um, I'm kind of going on a, a, a oh, I like back. this, I like this, I'm with you. Keep going, keep going. Uh, yeah. So then coming back to it, it's. The, Effectively, it's the same value proposition for DeFi. It's just that the people you need to stop, the, the, the people who would try to censor you are less scary, <laughs> right? So- um, I think I might've lost you there. The people who are trying to censor you are less right. scary. What do you so mean by that? The people who are trying to censor you in the case where you need Bitcoin are governments and they're, they're doing capital controls, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So like that's like the full force of like, the national, like the people who are, care about the integrity of the national currency are like mm. trying to stop you. So you have to be very, very robust there. Whereas with DeFi, effectively at the, like there, there's still government apparatus involved, but the people, the, the regulation of, of financial products, I think like in terms of who, the, who are the, who have the actual incentives there are not really governments, it's actually finance companies. So like, I think <clears throat> the people you're pissing off with DeFi are less the Federal Reserve and the IRS and all those people and more uh, Goldman Sachs, right? And people, because so much of finance is the, the so much of the, of the profit in finance is uh, able to be captured by limiting access, right? So there's a lot of regulations especially, you know, my perspective is fundamentally based in the US and it's different around the world, but it, I think it's like the same story more or less where so much of the of the money that like um, investment banks make is effectively in being able to prevent or, or restrict access to products. <clears throat> so in the US, for example, it you have to be, this is, it's changed a little bit in the recent years, but basically if you want to invest in a private, in a startup, for example, or if you want to buy any kind of exotic derivative, you have to be what's called an accredited investor. So you have to either make a bunch of money every year, or you have to have at least a million dollars, not counting your house, right? So you have, you have to kind of already be wealthy to participate in these, in basically the best investments. And so um, the, the thing about DeFi that's interesting for me is that uh, while it is not able to address all of the issues, it basically completely democratizes access to a whole class of financial instruments uh, that were really hard to get access to prior. So it is, um, it's, it's censorship resistance in a, in, a, in a way, or maybe that might, might not be the right term anymore, but it basically, it removes gatekeepers um, and allows anyone to access you know these markets that uh i think are you know are 
ultimately beneficial. Like I, th there's, as a reaction to Fed policy, like there's nowhere in the United States that you can get a savings account that gives you any kind of appreciable return, right? So if you're someone in the US and you have dollars and like you're just someone trying to save, right? I'm not talking about a big investor, but you're just trying to save. If you put those dollars in a savings account, you lose money in real terms because inflation is much higher <clears throat> than any kind of savings rate you can get, excuse me. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, who knows where it'll end up, but you can go to Curve or, or Yearn, right? And I can put stable coins into those, into the vaults there, and I can get 5%, right? Like, I know throughout the year, like, there was all this hype around yield farming and, and like just the 20,000 APR staking things and, and random shit like that. And whatever, that was fine. I don't give a shit about that though. Like the thing I'm, I'm excited about is that I, it looks like I'm going to be able to get, you know, five to 10% staking stable coins somewhere. And like that blows any other kind of savings account out of the water. And at the same time, you know, uh, as long as I trust the, uh, underlying smart contracts it's like as good as a savings account mm. you know it's 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 harder to rob you know <laughs> yes 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 uh, you know it, well, well, it, recently what i um was kind of thinking about and i found it kind of funny was is that these accredited investor laws right um yeah. so i think in canada for example it's like i think like if you're a normal person you're not allowed to put more than like 10 grand into a certain project uh, if it's, you know, whatever, some new speculative investment. Yeah, um, yeah. so the, the way it works is, I think it's similar in the U.S. where they have recently added something called the Jobs Act in the U.S. I don't know what it is in Canada, but it's, hmm. I think it's similar, where anyone now can participate in uh, in what would be kind of startup investing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically. But you're limited, yeah, you're capped at a certain proportion of your income and like there's all kinds but of- But what I found fascinating about that, I mean, I get kind of the ethos of it, you know, to some extent, but what I found fascinating is, is that I'm not allowed to buy, let's say $12,000, put it into a company that my buddy's starting that I'm like super confident about, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I am allowed to go and buy $12,000 worth of cheeseburgers. <laughs> yeah, if right. I, <laughs> if I wanted to go buy 12 grand <laughs> worth of cheeseburgers right now, nobody would stop me nobody yeah and by the well, way i might have to buy cheeseburgers <laughs> unless i'm wait are we talking about real cheeseburgers or is cheeseburgers? real cheese i could go to mcdonald's right now and buy like right. cheeseburgers i'm saying it's not I know, some, there's it's no not rules new, <laughs> no no not, not coin don't get excited thing. don't get excited no 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 it's not new cheeseburger coin actually i did make <laughs> cheeseburgers for lunch they were delicious but nice. i digress <laughs> um yeah yeah we recently got out of the downtown core and kind of uh out in the burbs now and so barbecues become a, a part of our nice. daily life nice. uh okay okay so uh, wow so fascinating um I, I gotta admit i gotta admit i gotta admit okay so i'm a bit of a, you know i i too consider myself a bitcoin maximalist um I I don't know if you remember, but when I was with Buttercoin, I was renting space at a place called Decentral, uh, which was run by Anthony Diorio, who's one of the founders of Ethereum. And on, oh, okay. So yeah, we're back on. Um, anyway, so yeah. what I was saying is, is that, I don't know if you remember, but I was renting space in Toronto back in the Buttercoin days from Anthony Diorio, who's one of the co-founders of mm -hmm. Ethereum. And then one yeah. of our calls was with them as they were working on the Ethereum project, right? Right. And so I, I had a bit of a, you know, front row seat, if you will. Um, uh, curious, what, what are your thoughts on, I mean, it seems like you're a fan and just generally speaking of like DeFi, but what, what, what are your thoughts about this like Turing, because you're a pretty techie guy, right? What are your thoughts on like this kind of this like Turing complete um, you know, blockchain, if you will, right? Like when you first heard about Ethereum, how has your perspective maybe evolved over time? Um, I'm less bullish. Like when I first heard about Ethereum, I was like, this is so cool, right? Because it was, you know, promising a lot, right? Uh, and I, I still think I'm optimistic because I think it's starting to find, with, with DeFi, for example, and some other things, it's starting to find real uses. Which is fantastic because it's it's been kind of searching for a use case for a long time, um, and 
I'm not sure that ultimately it's like the right, that the world computer sort of metaphor ends up being right. Um, I haven't been as in depth on like Ethereum 2.0 work as maybe I, I could have been. Uh, so I don't know, I, I don't actually have a good sense of if it's, if I believe that's gonna work or not. Um, but ultimately I think that uh, the, the question for me is how much of the, how important is it actually for the contracts, right, to be on chain? And because uh, I think that like, you have, you want to have some sort of turn complete computational contract. Yeah. Sorry. So go ahead. Yeah. You're talking about Ethereum. Yeah. So, uh, Arg. A question at like the root of Ethereum for me is uh, do you need the smart contracts themselves and the execution to be on chain, right? Because there's a bunch of things you can do around like um, basically off chain execution and publishing kind of proofs, right? Where people can validate things. And, and that, that's a lot of work around the Taproot stuff and, and, and Schnorr stuff. Uh, to support that, which is interesting, but ultimately, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think that uh, with appropriate layer two support and, and maybe like yeah, the sharding thing seems to me to be kind of a, a very questionable solution. Cause it reminds me a bit of BCH actually, uh, or, or not BCH, uh, Bitcoin SV. So the, you know, they're, they're like, yeah, you know, people are, are respected there. Some of them are, are kind of insane to me, but like the the my problem with the project isn't any of the kind of political stuff. It's that uh, there's, you know, they, they have like people posting videos and it's just put it being, all the data is just being put on the blockchain, right? And like, okay, it works. Yeah, you know, I, like I can't deny that it is working, right? Uh, at least in some respects, but just to me, the this the in a successful scenario where where you have real adoption of that, I don't understand how that scales. And so, the uh, I'm a little worried about the Ethereum sharding thing. I think it's more sane, but like ultimately, like um, if your answer is just like, I think it's a more reasonable scaling story. But at some point, um, just putting everything on chain, even if it's sharded, is like maybe. While, while viable, I think it might not be the right solution. So I, I am a fan of a lot of layer two approaches. Um, and you're even seeing that with things uh, like, I don't know if you've heard about Keeper. Uh, I don't think so. Keeper, that's an Ethereum. No. It's a, uh, it's, it, yeah, it's called K E E P three R. <laughs> But sure. um, whatever, it's a it's a job. It's basically a job running system for Ethereum, where we can get external agents to run jobs for you. Um, and one of the uses for it, the reason it was built up, is this thing that uh, one one of the guys that did Yearn is building called he's calling Meta Wallet. And the idea is that you know you can actually um, save a bunch on gas if you combine transactions. Uh, you know, off chain and then publish them in, in batches. And so, so it's like a very, it's interesting because like the way it's built is very like uh, ad hoc where it's not relying on any kind of protocol changes like, or like SegWit to save space in, in Bitcoin or um, any kind of like, it's basically just using the programmability of Ethereum. To, to batch stuff, which is which is neat. And I think you could do better than that even if you, if you had support from the protocol level. Um, some of the things that I, I like, this, I'm kind of just ranting now, but because some of the things that I uh, wish we, that we never saw from Ethereum that I was, that I thought were really important were things like, um, I forget what they called it, but it was basically like where if there were uh, pieces of commonly executed code, right, that they would, 
at the, in the white paper, the early days was like automatically get somehow optimized and included and basically where it wouldn't cost gas to do, right? It would be like a optimized function. Um, and I think like that wasn't necessarily a bad idea. And especially uh, because the use cases in Ethereum are so much like ERC20 focused, right? So like there's so much uh, of the code for so many different projects that is standard, right? And, um, you know, I think you get a lot of gas, like a lot of the economy uh, of, of throughput for Ethereum, it hasn't been explored yet. So the same way that, you know, Bitcoin, we talked about, there was like a block size debate, et cetera, and we ended up implementing SegWit, which is a way to increase throughput. But yeah, th there were things that were done and they were, you know, as opposed to just like sharding Bitcoin, right? There were there were things that actually went in and optimized the the, the throughput and, and performance uh, characteristics of it, and and there's still work that can be done there. Um, whereas Ethereum seems to have had a lot of interesting ideas that they have abandoned or or they just haven't been pushed. So even things like Plasma, just like just like a lot of layer two solutions in in Ethereum are not um, being. It doesn't feel like at least they're being seriously pursued because the, there's still this promise that sharding is just going to fix all the throughput issues. And mm. I'm not sold on that. Yeah. Hey, okay, I'm sorry. I mean, I could talk about this stuff forever too. Um, but I wanted to make sure, uh, like on the first thread, right, around your story, yeah, we you kind it. of paused it around the kind of the Buttercoin stage, right? But I'm curious, I, I don't know if you're able to share more, like kind of yeah. since then, what has your life looked like? Um, so since Buttercoin, I... I uh, moved to New York. I, I worked, uh, basically we lived across the street from Palantir <laughs> in, in, uh, in Palo Alto. And I ended mm -hmm. up getting, taking a job there under the condition that they moved me to New York. <laughs> uh, so I did that because I wanted to get back into stand-up comedy, which I've done. So I've been doing that for about four years. I'm in, in Las Vegas cool. right now. Um, I was at Palantir for a little bit, ended up switching. I, I went to Paxos uh, for almost a year, didn't, wasn't there for super long, but, um, well, I guess I was there for more than a year, but it was, it was on a part-time basis near the end and, uh, kind of at a time where they were, they were still really early and like looking at their gold, uh, settlement use cases and stuff, which, you know, they've obviously done some of that with, with PAX G, but they've also, you know, been doing a lot of, uh, I kind of left before the stable coin became, uh, an idea there. Um, and then I, I took uh, kind of a couple of years off uh, coasting on some of the savings and uh, doing, yeah, focus on stand up comedy as well as uh, writing TV shows and that, that kind of stuff. And then recently, basically in March, uh, right, right before, not, not because of the pandemic, but right before it, I ended up taking a, a full time position at um, namebase.io which is a uh, you know exchange as well as the exchange is actually a smaller part of the business like um, it's it's pretty interesting the the scope of kind of uh, products they have but it's built on top of something called the handshake protocol which um, I don't know if you're familiar with but it is a uh, a naming protocol which we've seen like a bunch of attempts at <clears throat> excuse me uh, this one is it's a uh, it has actually some things in, in, in common with Namecoin. I don't know if you remember that. That was like one of, of the early altcoins. Yeah, uh, of course. So Handshake is, like Namecoin, is forked more or less from Bitcoin. Uh, it, you know, it, it uses the same UTXO model and, and all that stuff and, and the same mining model, uh, but it adds the idea of covenants. So you actually have these on-chain auctions for names uh, and, and the ability to transfer as well as like update DNS on-chain for names. And, and, and the reason I, uh, I, I was like interested in it compared to like Namecoin or more reasonably things like uh, Unstoppable Domains or some of the other Ethereum-based naming projects um, is that it was designed from the start to play nicely with the existing DNS system. So it's built around DNS. So like the, the names can actually have DNS records baked into them on chain, which is cool. Uh, but also the consensus rules for the network uh, like the, you, you can't buy existing top level domains. So you can't get 
com or net or even Google because that that's a, a top level domain. And on top of that, they set aside the top hundred thousand Alexa search result names <clears throat> for uh, some time frame. I think it's like two years. And you can use DNSSEC. So if you own one of those those domains already, you can use DNSSEC to automatically and permissionlessly claim it on Handshake. Um, and so the, the whole idea of it is that uh, the the blockchain and the names on there, which are top level domains, so the equivalent of com. So I could get like dot Bennett, right, <laughs> or dot JS. That's one that was claimed or that was purchased. Uh, the idea is that um, you could actually start using Handshake as an alternative route for DNS. And so you'd have the ICANN route, which is like sort of the thing at the top of the internet in terms of names, it's like where everything is tracked. You'd have that and that would keep working normally. And then you could add this and all of a sudden everybody who uses the internet without having to do anything, without having to get a wallet or set up a special browser or do anything different would be able to get to these new domains. It's just a matter of a couple of big organizations adopting Handshake. Um, You're using I can get dot sunny. Uh, yeah, you, you should be able to, yeah. <laughs> but like, I don't get it. I thought if you wanted to dot something, you got to pay a ton of money to some organization or something. Right, yeah. Like so that. the way it works so right now, work? the way it works right now is that there's a company called ICANN. Or it's mm -hmm. an yeah, yeah. And uh, it used to be that it was very, very restricted and they opened up a bit where people- More go, like I can't. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Do -do yeah, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> but but when they when they opened it up, um, you know, that's why, why you have like dot exchange or dot finance mm. is because somebody applied the application fee is like $180,000. And that's just to apply, right? And then there's you have to basically set up a, a, a registrar and basically it's expensive. It costs like probably. That's what I thought. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So how does this, so does this, this doesn't circumvent that. Like someone's still got to pony up that, that 200 grand or whatever. No, it does. Right. So this oh. is a, it's a parallel system. So it's a, it's a, it's a blockchain based system where uh, you could go for any name that is not already managed by ICANN. Like they, they, the point is like, they didn't have to do that, but they could have just had to be any name, but they wanted it to be backwards compatible. Okay. Right? So that the, any name that's already managed by ICANN, they're like, we're, we're yeah, not going to. Yeah, that anyone. makes sense. Okay. But for this, it's basically uh, on a rolling schedule, names become available for for auction. Uh, and the auctions just take place on chain. There's no company running them. But you can take Handshake, which is the token of the network, right? And bid on names. And then the, the auction runs for like two weeks. And then at the end of it, uh, the, the winner pays the second highest price, right? And gets... Uh, gets the name um, and then they you know using signing transactions they can update the records for the name and stuff and right now um, there's ways where you can using something called either next dns or there's a website called hns.to which is like a, re a regular internet website that acts as a proxy to to this so you you can use the names and you can you, you if you if you know what you're doing or you know do some research you can configure your computer to resolve handshake names just like regular DNS names. But the, the long-term game is that, um, you know, if Google and Cloudflare decide they want to support handshake, then all of a sudden everybody who uses those, those are basically, basically just everybody would start seeing those names work regularly. Um, cool. Yeah. And there's a bunch of reasons they would might want to do it because like there's this is probably not worth getting into, but like, no, I'm interested because like I've had horrible experiences with GoDaddy and yeah. yeah. Well, and that's like, even with, even if you have good experience, like, like Google, I use Google domains for a lot of stuff and like, they're good. Right. But ultimately I'm just, I'm leasing a name. Right. It'd be cool to be able to actually be able to own in the same way that you own Bitcoin, right. You could own the keys for this name. And then like, as long as you renew it, which is, it doesn't cost anything. You just have to send a transaction every so often to keep it alive uh it's yours right nobody can take it um so yeah yeah no i talked to the unstoppable domains people recently and i was uh, pretty like mind blown about that yeah that people are building stuff like that because i definitely can see a need for that because the, the these entities uh they don't have the best security and you know and sometimes like uh yeah. 
you know, yeah, you don't, you don't want to have that as like a point of attack, I guess, as like as a business. As, as, yeah. As, yeah. Even, even like the, this is the, again, the more technical rabbit hole is that um, in parallel to the domain name system, there's this whole uh, security certificate system where when you go to like amazon.com and you see the green lock next to the, to the website name that tells you it's like verified, right? The way that that works is that there is similar to ICANN, there's, there's people at the top of this kind of hierarchy and they have a root, root certificate and then they sign these sub certificates. So Amazon gets a certificate and it's signed by them and your browser trusts them. So they trust Amazon, right? But um, there've been cases where the root certificates or some some sub certificate has been stolen and then you've been used to create like fake Amazon certificates. And so you could have these uh, these attackers or these, these you know, scammers where they could redirect you to a site that looks like it's amazon.com and says amazon.com and it has the security thing, but it's all been faked, right? Um, and this makes it much harder to do that because the, the trust in who owns the name, there's no, none of the certificate stuff. It's just like, you can look at the blockchain and see that this particular private key, I mean, you can't see the private key, but you see this particular public key owns the name. And so this website has been signed, right? And That's so cool. That's so wow. interesting. Yeah. What, what's, what do you, how long have you been there for a couple of months you said, or? It's about March. Yeah. Since March. Cool. And, and what's your role there, Bennett? Uh, I'm basically just doing backend development stuff. Nice. Uh, it's a pretty small team, so. Um, okay, so Bennett, we covered, well, kind of like somewhat quickly, but I know you, you don't have, you have a hard stop in about five minutes or so, but uh, I was going to say is uh, we covered your story. We covered a bit about, you know, some of the interesting projects you've been a part of. Um, uh, we also touched on kind of my next question, which was like a contrarian belief that you might have amongst like maybe Bitcoiners or, or did you, did you, did you address that? You kind of touched on it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how contrarian it is. It's, it's basically, it's, it's, it's the, the kind of weird belief I, I have is that I'm, I'm kind of a Bitcoin maximalist, but I'm not particularly like, I don't Attached to it. Yeah. It's just sort of, it's like the way I see things evolving and that um, I think you can make a lot of the, uh, it's, it's, I guess it's, I think you can make a lot of the same maximalist, the arguments that support Bitcoin from a maximalist perspective, or at least just from a value proposition perspective, I think uh, actually do apply to a bunch of other things in the space like DeFi. Um, mm, yeah, very interesting. And 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 as you were saying, there's like almost like a gradient of requirement of decentralization, you know, yeah. as a function of like what you're trying to do. Are you reinventing money, and right. you know, uh, or are you you know reinventing maybe like a financial um, you know application? Like a, a great example is I remember I think it was EOS. Uh, it may have been one of the other kind of Ethereum competitor chains, but I think it was EOS got a pretty big. Uh, use case or following around people building uh, decentralized casinos, right? And like, so I, I, I it's like EOS is not, I, I'm, I might be using the wrong chain, but whatever chain it was, wasn't particularly decentralized because they had like validator sets and it was like super nodes. And, and like, that's like basically you can go arrest 12 people or something and like control the chain, right? Uh, so, I mean, it's, I know it's, I'm oversimplifying, but like it's less, much less censorship resistant than Bitcoin or even Ethereum, right? Uh, but in terms of like how much censorship resistance do you need to start a distributed concedo? It's like it, almost anything is better than just like the regular internet because that shit just gets taken down. So the idea that it was just making it harder to get taken down was good enough for that use case, right? It's, I wouldn't want my digital gold to be there, but if I'm, if I'm, being able to run like a fly by night digital casino for six months, like that's better than doing it. I, I, I recently interviewed Addison, who, who was one, I think Ethereum's first lawyer. And we, yeah. we had this fascinating conversation around uh, le like the legal system and then like kind of what is enforced, you know, right. enforcement versus what kind of the rules are. And there's a huge set of rules out there. But yeah. what is actually enforced is far less because of like the, your you know resource constraint and et cetera, et cetera. And and businesses like Uber and whatnot, like they've kind of obviously played on that, right? They they've yeah. you know distributed or decentralized in, in kind of the right ways and and didn't break the rules in like a you know 
in a blatant kind of way, but served a need. And anyway, a lot there. But listen, man, okay, I know we only have a few minutes left. So is there, a, there were a couple of the questions like around any maybe a contrarian belief around like just something outside of Bitcoin. Um, any, anything on that front? Um, I mean, yeah, I'm sure you got I'm sure you got <laughs> We could do a follow-up too, man. Let's do a follow-up. I was gonna say, maybe let's just leave people with, uh, is, if people wanna, I don't know, just connect with you or learn more about you or whatever, is there a place where, where can you check out your your comedic skits? That's what I'm I'm interested in. Is uh, it stuff so on YouTube I, or what? I don't have a lot on. Uh, there's a little bit on YouTube, but I, I, probably the best place to follow me is um, at Ben Hoffman. But it's B E N N Hoffman on Twitter. Um, and yeah, sweet. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for doing this, man. Really appreciate it. And like I said, uh, uh, yeah, I would love to do this again whenever whenever you're down. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, I'll hit you up when I'm back in New York and have stolen. Right. <laughs> yeah, man, no problem. All right, perfect. Take care, Bennett. Yeah. Bye bye.